Welcome back to another episode of Time for a Reset. I'm your host, Paul Frampton Calero, and this is the podcast for marketing leaders across the world. The last time we spoke to you, we were broadcasting from La Croisette, uh, from Can Lion, where we gave you lots of insights and trends from marketing leaders. This time, we are broadcasting live from Madfest, Madfest in London, which received nearly 15,000 visitors over three days just last week. And we decided to take a really deep look into the retail media, the commerce media space. So delighted to be joined by four very kind of well-known leaders in the retail media space to talk to us about why retail media has become such a big topic, why it's grown so fast, and the key differences between the UK and the US. Delighted to be here with Carl Carter from Sakana here at Madfest. The weather is not quite the same as the last time we saw each other in Cannes on the Quasette, uh, Carl. But one thing that is the same is the focus on retail media and the conversation here. So fascinated about why you personally think that has become such a hot topic. Yeah, I mean, look, there's probably a number of reasons. I think the main one, which if I'm honest, everyone's going to be going, oh, let's just punch him in the face for saying it, but you know, deprecation of cookies, changes in privacy have meant that you know, we're all looking for a new data source. So certainly a lot of advertisers are. Mm -hmm. They need to you know, target with precision, understand audiences. Right. I think that's driving a lot of what we're seeing. But mm -hmm. I think if you, if you intersect that fu fundamentally with, you know, the retailers are the place that have rich data, right? They understand the consumer, mm -hmm. but equally, they've got really good inventory. Mm -hmm. like from a media perspective, they've got great inventory. Right. So I think combining those things, it's a little bit like the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're in a little bit of chaos. I mean, we're all bored about talking about deprecation of cookies. And, you know, we're seeing the industry respond to that. So I think that's one of them. The, the final bit, if I'm completely honest with you, the mm -hmm. second you give a retailer that opportunity, they want to make money, right? right? Especially high margin revenue. <laughs> high margin revenue, yeah. You're used to selling products on a shelf mm -hmm. and doing it in high volume. And it's a very competitive space, especially in the UK. Right. It's a perfect opportunity for a retailer. Um, but also it's a perfect opportunity for ad tech industry, uh -huh. for advertisers, yeah? For businesses like ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it also feels that there's an opportunity to reset some of the challenges with just media per se, the measurement's mm. not been great, the targeting's not been great. Even in a world with third-party cookies, let's be honest, there was questionable kind of quality, hence the rise of attention and all these other Absolutely. metrics that everyone's talking about. Yeah, MTA was not the answer, right? No. We thought it was, but it wasn't no, the answer. No. Yeah, if you're still doing MTA, maybe look somewhere else. Um, and what would you say the key growth drivers are for retail reader revenue in the UK? Like what are the mm. retailers that are growing fastest doing differently? So I think, I think it's interesting and that, you know, coming here today, I've seen a lot of interesting conversations. You had a fantastic panel today. But what really resonated with me was that, you know, we talk about, you know, what, what do retailers do? Well, I think they're focused on the owned and operated in the UK. Right. I actually think they're particularly intelligent because mm -hmm. what's the one thing as a retailer you can control? your owned and operated asset, whether that be e-commerce sites, mm -hmm. that could be your in-store inventory with Shopper Media. Yeah. Hey, focus there. And I think UK retailers are doing that particularly well. Right. Um, Dean Harris today spoke about some great piece of work that he's, he's done with uh, my team on halo measurement, understanding, you know, advertising that happens in shopper media mm -hmm. in co-op. Yeah. What's the effect on other retail stores? And I think that's really, again, what an intelligent way to approach what a great it. Way. What, I mean, if, if all media owners thought like that, exactly <laughs> the right. world would be somewhat different. And I think going back to your point there on measurement, so that's then us starting to think, well, what is the value of retail media? Mm -hmm. Not just for the retailer, but for everyone involved, for the right. advertiser. And I think for right. me, that's where UK is doing a really good job, mm -hmm. owned and operated. Is it perfect? No. Mm -hmm. I think they've got to evolve the story of offsite, yeah. um, which I'm sure we'll talk about the US in a second, where that's yeah. particularly prevalent. But I think... That piece has to evolve. And I, I do challenge, um, being really truthful, the idea that commercially, is it going to be viable from a scaling point of view? There are a lot of partners that have to come into play when you right. do offsite ID resolution, right? All the matching pieces. You've then got going ad tech platforms. Right. All of a sudden, your CPM is going to get pretty bloated. Right. And I've because worked of in the number of players involved, right? Exactly right. But the benefits are there. You've got rich data gets your audience, mm -hmm. gets your precision, and then you can get to scale with look like modeling, but a cost to right. do so. If I'm sat there and I'm someone like P&G or Unilever, mm -hmm. I'm gonna look at my traditional methods and go, you know what, back in the day, it was a bit prey and, uh, prey and spray, but mm -hmm. I could measure what I wasted. Right. Am I gonna get to the place where I'm just, it's costing me so much, I haven't, I've just got a different yeah. way to look at the balance, but I do believe we're gonna find the right place to be. Okay. 
So there's some really interesting stuff in there, Carl, that I'd like to dissect a little. One kind of, to me, sounds a little bit like what happened with programmatic. <laughs> um, <laughs> that if you look at the difference between yeah. the US and the UK, programmatic's huge in the US, but actually it's always... It's always had a slightly challenging yeah. reputation in the UK. Mm. You talk to advertisers, retailers about data monetization. Mm. In the US, they're all biting your hand off and they're like, well, this looks like an easy way to generate incremental revenue. Whereas mm. I see a lot more conservativeness from retailers here, partly because of what you say, owned and operated mm. is owned. Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, you can control it. So what differences do you see in the way that UK versus US retailers approach them? I mean, scale is obviously understandable difference, but yeah. why do you think there are different ways? You, you said a minute ago, you think some of the UK retailers are a little bit more intelligent about mm. how they approach it? Yeah, and I should probably say at this point, we're for a US business. Don't want to, don't want to offend <laughs> He's not US. saying that Americans aren't intelligent. <laughs> I don't want to say, I, I think it's a very different market. And going back to the scale base, I know it's a bit obvious, but take it at the broadest level, 340 million people, right? Mm. First of all, if you think about ad spend, it's 10 times the size of the UK in total ad spend. Yeah. All of a sudden, the scales are very different play, but it's a much broader play in that respect, which is right. where I think the programmatic offsite piece works, yeah? Very digitally native, lots of devices, lots of households. It's yeah. easy to carve up that market, make some money. Mm -hmm. I would also say you've got single language pieces as well. Now I represent not only UK, but Europe right. in my role. Um, but I think that's much more difficult when you come back to the UK. You mm -hmm. haven't got the scale of inventory to reach mm -hmm. 340 million people. Right. You've got 66 of which, how many of those are truly addressable? You've got to be more creative. And I think that's the difference between US versus UK. We do have to be creative. You know why I think, you know, shopper, shopper marketing, for instance, has evolved. Yeah. Why? Well, Dean said it earlier, you know, for him, like 85% plus are still going into the store, bricks and mortar. Why are you going to spend money on programmatic mm -hmm. if fundamentally that's where your customer is? And again, Oli Shea said the same this morning on the panel, yeah. didn't he? He did. He Follow did. customer. Um, and so I think the UK has done that particularly well. Um, interesting. And I think it's going to be interesting to see European retailers and whether or not they can yeah. do the same in creativity. No, I, that was going to be my next question, actually, Carl, because obviously, as you pointed out, there's a lot of population mm. dispersed across a lot of geographies in Europe with lots of different languages. And let's be honest, retailers that don't have such amount of scale or footprint, how are you seeing creativity come to bear in some of those other European markets in how, how retailers are approaching it? Yeah, so I think, I think it's a similar thing, right? They're still looking at where is their customer. I've seen some retailers really lean heavy into their e-com proposition first. Okay. Ironically, those retailers don't have a very strong e-commerce e proposition or right. the share of their sales going through e-commerce. But, but of course, back to your programmatic statement, shiny, exciting, mm -hmm. you know, people want to get into the tech space. Right. Reality is, keep it super simple. If you take any of those markets in, you know, out of home, for instance, is a great example in somewhere like Spain. It's a really, really prevalent channel still. Yes. Yeah. So all of a sudden you're leaning into a much more traditional methods of retail media. So right. I it's think the data that's driving it, but the place, the format, placement and the location is different. It's traditional. Yeah. And I think, so if I think from my own perspective in a measurement um, mm. way of thinking, all of a sudden, I'm not thinking about custom level closed loop attribution because you're never going to get the scale and the right. cost is going to be too much. Mm. I'm thinking you do simple test versus control based on locations. What happened to sales? You, you, you can basically prove the value and you can do that on a much smaller budget. Right. You know, you can have a 20 grand, mm -hmm. maybe even a 10 grand shopper campaign, do a very simple measurement. Right. So I think Just that's the that. nuances of how we're going to have to think differently. Same concept, yeah. different scale. Yeah, no, interesting. Yeah. And finally, if you had a big orange reset button <laughs> on the table in front of us, which I've, do, I've realized I now need to buy because I keep saying it in every podcast and I haven't actually got one. I want to find you one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that would be great. Um, if you had one, what would you hit reset on? Whether it's in retail or Ooh. marketing or media or, or anything, really. Well, I'd probably be hitting it a number of times a day. But I think, look, for me, I'm going to be very selfish in the answer. And I am going to talk about measurement. Okay. Um, here, here's how I feel right now. I thought we were getting to a really nice space in measurement where we believed it was important to have, you know, verified third-party measurement that were not involved in media. You could just say, right, that's your role. You're going to tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. I really would like to see the industry doing more of that. I think we're very siloed right now, retail by retail. And I think, you know, you and I have had this conversation that if you're mm -hmm. a CMO, a big advertiser, you look at advertising, you look at promotion, you want to look at how do I share my spend across right. those? Across every tactical channel. Yeah. It's strategic. 
And of course, you also want to do the tactical to bring that up and know mm -hmm. more holistically how your spend's working. Right. I want to see us reset that. I want to see us get more holistic. I want to see us lean into verification third party. And I'm selfish in that because that's what I do. Sure. But I think it's important we do that because the only way we're going to get to the single source of truth and actually drive the whole industry in a more collaborative right. way, I think, is to do that. Right. No, I think that's a really good one because let, let's face it, if you don't know what's working and you're not attributing effectively, then pretty much every decision that a marketer or a media agency is making on your behalf is flawed. Yeah. And yet we spend an inordinate amount of time talking about lots of other things other than measurement. Um, so I think that's a great reset. So thank yeah. you, Carl, for joining us today. Absolute pleasure. So delighted to be joined by Dean Harris, who runs the Carps Retail Media Network. Uh, welcome, Dean. Hi, Paul. Yeah. And we've both spoken today at Madfest uh, on various retail media panels. And it feels like retail media has definitely got more of a focus here this year than last year. And that seems to be the case in most conferences. So t tell me why you think that is. I know there's more here. There's more yachts at Cam. It's everywhere, <laughs> isn't it? It's all over our LinkedIn feed. I think the big, there's probably three things, mm -hmm. I think, why the retail media boom is happening. Um, and the key underlying theme behind them all is it's going with the grain, not against the grain. For right. years, the advertising industry has spoken about the importance of data. Mm -hmm. Agencies are talking about data-driven, CRM data-driven, loyalty data-driven. Every single person involved in the advertising industry right. has caught upon the fact that data is the linchpin. And income retailers with the richest data source available, mm -hmm. able to target people on known behavior, not assume right behavior. So that targeting aspect is the value and, and driving some of that need. Mm -hmm. The other thing is retail media keeps the CFO happy, right? So on the, on the other side, you've got that measurement, that closed loop measurement that I showed that ad to that person mm -hmm. and that person then bought that thing. Right. And you've got this mixed, you know, um, media modeling, um, approach that's still built on assumptions and right. consumers are behaving even more complex. The, the funnel is like spaghetti junction now. So yeah. retailers provide some reassurance that your ad spend is doing well. And lastly, the changes in the fragmentation of media mm -hmm. mean eyeballs are hard to find in a single place. Everyone yeah. shares their attention across the whole spectrum of social, web, TV, whereas everyone buys groceries, right? and everyone buys them all the time. So you've got some consistent eyeballs there. So you've got the targeting, the measurement, and the reach. You glue all those mm -hmm. things together, and a brand advertiser is gonna be interested. Right, great, I love that. And for you, I mean, it feels like Co-op has really kind of pushed and has grown and built a proposition that has really connected and landed in the market. What is the key driver of growth for what you're doing? Like, well, I, we talk a lot about the US versus the UK and there are different yeah. things that drive the scale there. But for you, you're obviously in convenience, yeah. different to a grocer, yeah. uh, different to an e-commerce only player. So what, what are the drivers of growth for you? I suppose, well, if you look at, I had a great question from our CMO, Kenyatta Nelson. It's like, it's great that you're performing really well. I think every retail media network's growing year on year. Right. It's like, where's the money coming from? Where is it coming from? Who's losing, Dean, right. for, for, for us to win? And, um, and, it, and it's predominantly from the performance marketing channels. You search, your social that doesn't utilize a retailer. That media mm -hmm. that focuses more on the end of the funnel, the conversion point. Yeah. That's where the money's coming from in retail media. For future growth, I think it'll start to come from those media agency pots, mm -hmm. those brand pots. Okay. And as brands start to organize themselves less around silos where you've got the shopper budget, the trade budget, the brand budget, I'm aware already that some brands are putting all those together because they know yeah. it's not working mm -hmm. as channel specialists because that funnels spaghetti junction, as I said. Right. So the growth is coming from performance marketing mm -hmm. and then in the future it's going to come from other pots. Inconvenience, our, our proposition is additive. We're essentially saying that we're different but complementary to supermarket media. Right. If you're a retailer that wants broad distribution, you'll focus on online, you'll focus on quick right. commerce, you'll focus on a trolley, and you'll mm -hmm. focus on a basket. And our model is if you want to pick up those close to home, impromptu, unplanned, mm -hmm. need it now, buy it now missions, convenience is there. Yeah. And the transaction volume is massive. So market share is low, but that's because you're spending a fiver, a tenner versus right. 100 quid. So the eyeballs that convenience reach is still really impressive. I think we're yeah. number two in transactions. And the frequency is presumably yeah. higher as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. that. And 
So you've got this proximity, you've got this frequency, you've got a compact store. If you think about uh, a coffee ad in a supermarket, mm -hmm. right? It's on the coffee and tea aisle seen by people buying coffee and tea. Right. In a convenience store, it's on the bread, biscuit, cereal, coffee and tea aisle. So mm -hmm. you get this discovery and visibility of advertising yeah. that drives some mental availability. So Interesting. there's co-op scale because convenience is hard to find scale because it's lots of independent right. retailers, co-op market leaders. So we have the scale and then mm -hmm. we have the difference. You glue that together and we can offer something that's different to supermarket media. Yeah. Acknowledging, of course, that we don't have their loyalty scale. We don't have their spend scale. Right. But different. But you're very clear on your additive proposition that joins up with other. Yeah. You're not going to be the only retail media network on a plan, but you have a unique place alongside others, I think is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. All we're trying to do is say, don't think about it's retail media or it's not. It's retail media. And then within that, there's supermarket missions and there's convenience missions. Right. What we're not saying is it's Tesco or co-op. It's right. Tesco and co-op. And we just need to make sure it's compelling enough and it's easy enough to work with us to right. add us to a media plan. Right. Great point. On that point, then, um, I, I know that you guys have done some really interesting stuff in terms of measurement around yeah. measuring what happens in your, like, advertising in your stores and how that affects the rest of the market. So I'm sure we'll touch on that um, in a minute. But I'm also interested in your point about how you make yourselves easy to work with and you kind of keep up with the changing demands of the brands that obviously sell stuff in your stores. So I often call it sophistication. Uh, how do you keep up with the growing, even if potentially slight slow growing of sophistication on the brand FMCG side? Yeah, there's a little, there's a little, one of the, the things I've realized is a model that works for the supermarkets won't work for us. So one of the things okay. we have to communicate for a brand is convenience is different. You need to unlock that value in different ways. So if a brand, brand wants these ultra levels of breakdowns in segmentation, and they're trying to mirror the breakdown of a basket like they do for a supermarket, right. we need to support them when we're going, well, if you're targeting someone mm -hmm. watching the football this weekend, that's different to, do they buy beer? Yes, no. You're looking right. for other signals in the market. So our sophistication mm -hmm needs to be relevant to our proposition. Yeah. So that's the thing that's quite challenging for us. It's really the quickest thing you can do mm -hmm. in um, advertising is comms. So you can launch a brand quickly, right. you can talk about it quickly. The thing that takes a while is making sure your products correspond Line up with the comms. and the, the yeah, way you, you're worked with. So if we're, I think in market share in the UK, as a grocer, we're about seventh, but if you discount Aldi and Lidl, because they're less, yeah. Uh, present in the retail media business. You've got to go, why would someone go all the way down to fifth and go, I want them in my media plan? Right. And that requires sophistication and difference, but nice. with the customer in mind. Oh, I like that. It feels like you have thought long and hard about your value proposition, which let's face it, if there are, I think Jill from Critio said earlier, there are at the last count, 670 different wow. networks in the yeah. world. I mean, let's be honest, most of those in the US. Yeah. But even here, there's 20, 30, 40 and growing. You really have to have something that stands out because let's be honest, most brands, whether they have buyers in-house or they have agencies, are not going to be able to trade with that many different buying no. points. No, and um, I, I said something that I, I don't know if it struck the wrong chord and it was about six months ago <laughs> where I was on a panel and I said, look, you could probably take the description of each of all the other supermarket retail media networks put them on a page, mm -hmm. put the logos above them and try and figure out which one matches it. And they'll all probably say very similar things. Yeah. And what we needed to do because of that difference is have a really clear positioning and a really clear proposition. Mm -hmm. And we're quite lucky because the co-op doesn't have a hedge fund or a pension fund right. or the PLC shareholders breathing down our neck. Yeah, that's we're in control of our own fate. So we could make sure we've got the right um, strategy in place and now it makes it so easy to say yes or no yeah. to different products, different partners, different vendors. Whereas a lot of the other big retailers are having to chase after the tinfoil like a magpie. Right. And to some extent, they need to close margin gaps yeah. that are created yeah. in their retail business exactly. uh, because yeah. of the change in the dynamics. And it's interesting you say that point about almost like rip and replace that everything looks similar. There was a presentation on one of the stages uh, yesterday about sameness in almost every category and the fact that quite often car ads look very similar. Burger ads look very similar. Yeah. We all know what that looks like. So I think you make a really valid point about that differentiation and value proposition. So 
The last question I was going to ask you was going to be about if you had a big orange button in the middle yeah. of the table to reset something in retail media or retail marketing that you would change tomorrow, what would that be? From a co-op experience. From your yeah. perspective. I mean, it can be more from a, I think the industry would be better if we did things this way. Yeah. So a, a, a couple of things, I think. From, from an experience of um, looking after co-ops retail media business since last January, thing I've learned and made mistakes on is headline following. Okay. You know, the latest headline on this retail media network has now partnered with this media agency right. or launched this new product. And then you've made the assumption that that's the right thing to do for yeah, us. A great and you point. follow it. So this, this sort of taking a breath and not letting the mm -hmm. exec see emails that circulate around influence right. your decisions. You stick right. to your clear and cut strategy. So I have made some mis mistakes in the past where I've followed Sure. I should have done what's I right. I think all of us business. have, right? But yeah. it's a great call out. Because there's no blueprint, as someone's referenced earlier um, earlier today in a session. We're kind of painting the future ourselves. I think um, we could have, as an industry, moved from promise to performance sooner. Okay. I think we spent a long time in promise and we should have led the way. Now the brands are asking for it and we're reacting to it. We could have right. been proactive right. with that. And it feels like the industry has to some extent responded from pressure to from get the brands, there. For proof of incrementality. Rather yeah. than doing yeah, what yeah, was yeah. right. At the end of the day, the brands are our clients. We need to be a client-centric business. We need to be one step ahead of what they want and what they expect. Right. So that, we, I think, we nice. could have reset that. I really appreciate the candor. Um, I think there's definitely some truth in that, um, that often uh, industry takes a while to catch up until there's a, there's a force field that makes <laughs> yeah. third-party cookies depreciation. I think is a great yeah, example exactly. of that, right? Um, but look, I really enjoyed that conversation. Likewise. Thank you for making the time, Dean. Brilliant. Hey, Jill, lovely to see you uh, to see here you. at mm -hmm. MabFest. We saw each other recently in Cannes. Um, weather's not quite so good here, but uh, <laughs> still a really good conference. Yeah. Retail media, commerce media was like obviously a really big theme in Cannes, and it's a really big theme here in MadFest. Why, why do you think it suddenly got so much interest? You've got to remember that retail media is there, or commerce media in a broader sense, is secondary to their core business. Right. And if you forget that, then you have a really, really good chance of maybe not getting it right. Yeah, no, it, I think it's interesting, isn't it, that retailers need to have a media business, but media, the media business is, to your point, secondary to the fact that they have to serve customers in-store and online yeah. all day long, every day long. And that's where the majority of the revenue is going to come from, even if the higher margin may come from some of the media business, at and, least for today. And it's a... And it, well, it's a... It's a I don't think, I hope I'm not doing any of our partners a disservice when I say this, but I don't think I've ever experienced a retailer making a choice on retail media over making the choice of them as a retailer. I, I think they will always put the customer first. Mm -hmm. They will always make a decision that, that supports their core business right. over, over their retail media business. And look, we've all heard the 5% um, kind of target mm -hmm. of like 5% of of your overall GMV should be coming from retail media, right? Like, it's in my, dangerous throwing around on numbers like that, isn't it? It's unrealistic. I think mm -hmm. the US is 2.8 at the moment, and we know that's a mature market and a scale market. Mm -hmm. The numbers that we see from the IAB predominantly suggest yeah. that it's about 0.8% in Europe. 0.8 um, to 5 is quite a big shift. That's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Organisationally... Yeah. Um, kind of from a maturity perspective, I think that we need to allow retailers to come into this space in the way that they want to. And then I think it's incumbent on the likes of consultants, on the likes of their tech partners, mm -hmm. on, uh, if they've got commercial partners. And there's, as you say, many, many different flavors of how people right. set things up. But it's it's incumbent on us to give them the information that enables them to make informed choices right. that support them as a, as a retail proposition mm -hmm. as well as a media proposition. Nice. So, right, right. yeah. And, and if there was something that you would reset either in the retail media space or just more broadly in marketing, if you had a big orange button on the table in front of you, what would you reset? I love the idea of the orange button. Can I, have <laughs> I need one to of, actually get one. Can I, you know, but actually, can I have one as well? <laughs> no, um, so uh, I, I, I think... If if anybody has, you know, we, we, we were talking about it when we were in Cannes last, last week or two weeks ago. Mm. And um, I think the predominance of the skew, I, if I were going to tear something up, I would, I would tear up the traditional funnel. Okay. Because I think 
if you think about the way that that we've thought about it, we've thought about a broad set of audiences that we'd quite mm -hmm. be interested in going after. Right. And then we've built a strategy about how to get them to basket, mm -hmm. right? Like I remember I was publisher of CNET years ago and I used to spend all my time trying to work out how I could prove that reading a review on my website would would enable, would provide the right, right. use for somebody yeah, to put signal, that product it, it was a signal, right? And the way that we think about it at Critio is we think about the inverted funnel. So you start with the deterministic data, you start okay. with the product, mm -hmm. you start with the skew, and you understand that. So you understand who's bought it. Right. You understand what else they had in their basket. You understand the frequency of which they bought it. You understand the price point at mm -hmm. which they bought it. And if you can really understand the behavior around the purchase of the product. Right, there's a lot of richness. Yeah. Then you start there. So you start from a rich, mm -hmm. detailed understanding of the SKU or the, I mean, we call it a SKU, but it's really a product. Right. And you start to understand the people who are attracted to that and you build from mm -hmm. the product and the engagement with the consumer. Interesting. And then you start to layer on marketing activities that are founded from that understanding. Right. So. I think for years we've spent it looking at it the other way around. But um, if ultimately you want to to sell product, um, then you need to understand the right. buyer rhythms of that product, the, yeah. the way in which customers engage with it. And that well, makes the, and for a the small data term. point that tells you most about the customer yeah. anyway, because yeah. everything else is lifestyle, loosely behavioral, rather than actually purchase decisions. And I think I love that reset because, and I called this out on the panel earlier, that there's a danger retail media end up, ends up going down the same path that just all performance marketing did, all digital did, where it's like, well, it's all about the bottom of the funnel and driving sales because you can measure it, because you can see someone's bought, then push them down there. But of course, actually, the data, all it's telling you is the propensity for someone to buy, the frequency, what they're willing to pay. It's, to, it's giving you all of the information that you need to determine the customer journey. Yeah. And then you determine at what points during that customer journey should I appear and message, yeah. whereas everybody has has a tendency to go to, if you can measure stuff, then just try and drive as quick a sale or as quick a click-based attribution as possible. Well, I think there's an assumed understanding of the consumer, right, which is going to become more and more difficult to right. realise, right, as we get into yeah. 2025 and beyond. But if we can really understand how products are sold, how, what, what, it, what fundamentals of that product mm -hmm. engage different sets of consumers. Right. So it's not to ignore the consumer, but it's to merge the understanding of both mm -hmm. the product and the consumer. I'll tell you something that we've started to, to hear quite considerably. I mean, retail media, when people ask me about commerce media versus mm -hmm. retail media, I, I don't have a perfectly canned answer to it. But sure. when I think about retail media, I think about... I'm a brand, I want to sell product within this specific retailer's environment. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in the combination of the product, mm -hmm. the retail environment, that specific retailer's environment and the customers. Yeah. And it's that combination and mm -hmm. the activities that you have within that retailer's environment that really ultimately drive the retail. When I think about commerce media more broadly, if I think about a brand today and I'm looking at, so, um, 660 retail media networks. Mm. If I have direct relationships with 20 of them, how do I make sense of the 640 left over? At GCSE maths I work in. <laughs> but how do I oh, how do I make um how do I make sense of that? Yeah, and determine whether I'm missing anything by not. But if you start so. with the skew and you say, I'm interested in selling these products. Right. in retail environments that then can the then go to mask it, basket, kind of comes to the surface. it starts to change the way that you think about retail media networks. And I think there's a lot of noise around this area at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and it's difficult because you've definitely got a tension that I take very seriously, which is retailers celebrate the uniqueness of them being and, and right. what they... So so there's a, you and I were sitting in a room um, at Isabel last week when we were talking about, um, you know, what was the measurement that we were talking about? And 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 I, category. Yeah, yeah, and I think that there was something about you standardization in measurement shouldn't mean that you lose differentiation. Right. I think it was Alice. No, you're right. And I, I heard that loud and clear on the panel today yeah. that people are willing to 
standardized so it's easier for the buyer, but they don't want to lose their different differentiation and USP yeah. between Sainsbury's and Boots and uh, Tesco. I mean, yeah. why would they? And so there's always going to be, and the, uh, there's going to be a huge amount of continuing focus on matching the consumer, the SKU, and the and that specific retailer, and that, and we yeah. and we should celebrate that. That's very important. But there is going to be a role based on the fact that there is such fragmentation in Europe mm -hmm. that there is a role for saying, how do I sell more of my product to the right audiences and do it within a known set of retailers? Mm -hmm. Now, I go back to the differentiation, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a, that, that, there, is, there is a little bit of a rub saying that. Right. But, I, but as, if you want to scale brand spend if you want to scale it you've mm -hmm. got to make it easy for you've them got to, make to it buy easy. Yeah. so it'll be interesting to see how that manifests we've got we've got a few thoughts about how that might work out um i know there's other companies looking at that and so and technology and ai can solve that it's just a question of operationally commercially politically whether retailers yes. will want to go down that path yeah and also you know the technology can't be the answer to it technology should no. be the quiet part about this should be yeah. the enabler yeah and and at the end of the day, this is about marketing. So um, how do you make the creative, the marketing, mm -hmm. the the customer, the customers that you're trying to reach if you know them already, the new customers mm -hmm. you're trying to attract if you don't? How do you make those strategies work? Yeah, and more drive the right yeah. response and and performance without taking away mm -hmm. from it just because you're trying to kind of make sense of right. this complex network of, of retailers and it, it it's a difficult problem mm -hmm. um but you know i think that that it'll be interesting to see how that manifests itself Brilliant. Just well say. i can't think of a better place to leave it okay. um super valuable nuggets in all of that conversation <laughs> thanks so for thank your you time. Jim. Appreciate thanks for it. the time delighted to be joined by ollie share uh from boots ollie uh you kindly been on the podcast before uh and we're at madfest after you seem to have been pretty busy the last few weeks can we were both in can then you were at the Path to Purchase Summit, I think, in Chicago, weren't yeah. you? Uh, and now at Madfest. And you, you, we can't escape the focus on retail media and commerce. And obviously, Boots Media Group has been going from kind of strength to strength. Why, why is there such a big focus on this area in all marketing and media conferences right now? Yeah, it's a super, firstly, lovely to see you, Paul. Great to be here at Madfest. Um, I think at the moment, and it's been nice to us kind of been seeing different parts of the industry over the last few weeks, is I think there's just a real energy around it because it's getting more focused because I think talks a lot about it. I feel like we're growing up as an industry. Mm -hmm. I felt like about 12 months ago, it was beginning in the sort of startup stage, it's a real growth stage. And I think what we've seen over the last 12 months is both brands and retailers yeah. um, have really leaned into this territory. And what you're seeing now is great case studies about why, what's working, mm -hmm. um, but you're also seeing, you know, really strong investment from retailers in this space. Uh, and I think what, what was evident from Cannes is that this is now a really, really important and serious part of the industry. Yeah. You know, you saw on the Cosette, you know, big, US retailers taking significant space mm, to talk did. about their offering. And I think that for me just puts it in a very different territory. So, and I think we talked a bit earlier in our session is mm. this move from retail media as a kind of separate entity to being really key part of right. media work that's happening. Yeah. So I think all those things together uh, and brands are evolving their offerings as well uh, with regards to how they're organized to really mm. think about that. So yeah. yeah, it's been a great, it's been a great couple of weeks, really good. And it's wonderful to see so much energy around the industry. I agree. I agree. It's nice when there's momentum and energy. And on our panel earlier, we talk quite a lot about the, the evolution of how brands are kind of changing their model to work with retailers. Can you maybe just share, like, a shine a light on that for a second and how you're seeing some of that evolve? Yeah, and I think, I mean, we, we touched a little bit on it. I think it's really evolution. It's massively evolutionary. Mm. I mean, I said, as an FMCG advertiser for a long time, and, you know, previously the integration between, you know, traditional media what was shopper media and trading media was all kept very separate mm. from a, as, a, as an FMCG. And I think what you're seeing now is that as, as a media director in an FMCG role, actually you now have access to firstly an understanding of effectiveness. So you can see, okay, what does my advertising do <laughs> which rapidly, is which is massively <laughs> helpful, hugely helpful. Don't have to wait for the MMM three months later. Mm. Um, and I think what you're also seeing though is that that means you've got to break down probably long existing structures that have probably existed at both a global and a local level Absolutely. for quite a long time. Uh, and I think so that takes change, but you know, the, the ones who are really making that change and mm -hmm. embracing it, I see as really the pioneers who are accelerating into this space faster and are probably seeing the best results. Yeah. So that's the bit where I think 
you are seeing people kind of tread their own path. But equally, much like all retailers are different, all FMCGs have their own structure. And I think being able to work through that is also going to be part yeah, of the Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's, I think it's part of the, the excitement about it, that there isn't just one or two obvious no. models. I mean, I'm sure we'd all like some standardization. We were both 100%. at the Isbar session and that needs to happen, right? But 100%. Um, equally, retail is all about differentiation. Like mm. many of the retailers sell the same products, right? But it's about the differentiation of the experience often, isn't it? 100%. And we can't lose sight of that. Um, what do you what do you see as the key growth drivers in the UK for Boost Media Group or any other kind of retail media proposition? Because we talked on the panel earlier about the fact that the US approach to scaling is somewhat different, like more data monetization, more sponsor search, more kind of offsite. Yeah. Whereas the UK is a bit different. What what, what are you betting on as as Boots Media Group? I mean, I think for me, I mean, the US say being there last week, we've it's really clear there's a very, very strong integration between data and ad tech there. That's a huge bet they've made. It's a really deep integration. I think you've got agency integrations into that yeah. as well. I think with the UK, what we've got to look at is fundamentally, it's about the consumer experience that you give and the value that you give customers. Mm -hmm. the, the part we mustn't lose sight of is that yeah, the data that's powering this is customer data. Right. And therefore, the experience that we give them, the value exchange that we give for that experience is really important. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about how do we create amazing experiences for our customers, either in the products that we offer them and right. showcase to them, either in the experiences they might have in a store environment uh, or online, and we make it the best that that can possibly be. And I think that will unlock the growth for our industry, doing that in the right way. And then to your point, standardizing the way that mm -hmm. brands can see that effectiveness between partners on an even scale is really important for us to accelerate that, uh, the kind of growth in the next few years. Great. And that's, I hear that loud and clear, the focus on the customer. And it feels like an obvious thing to say, yeah, but yeah, I hear it a lot more from the people that run UK retail media networks than I do in the US. Not, not to say that they're not thinking about the customer, but no. often it's about the new tech that's or, or opportunity that tech has enabled that's going to create that new revenue stream rather than how do we enhance or create, I think um, Amir on the panel earlier called it, how do we create additive kind yeah. of experiences through advertising rather than just something that, that creates friction? Yeah, and I think you know, you've got to look at it that um, ultimately if it's only about data um, transferring or data monetization, that's not real. That's not a value exchange for the customer. Right. The, the value exchange for the customer is the better experience in what they what they have uh, from mm -hmm. when they go to the store or an experience that they have while yeah. they're in the store or even online. So I think that for me has always been the heart. And ultimately, I think UK retail has always been about that. It's always been about strong customer experience. Sure. Not that the US sure. hasn't been, but I think possibly due to the size and the scale of it, it's it's it's, it's a bit more easier to yeah. do that. And yeah. you know. And also it's so, I mean, it's so massive. You've got kind of even regional state uh, right. retailers over true. there who are as big as some of our largest retailers yeah, in the UK. That's true. So, um, and I think, you know, we must be totally generic over there are very different strategies that they each have for it, but there is definitely a theme over monetization. Yeah, yeah. okay, I like that. And last question, um, Carl from Sakana, obviously they're in the measurement space. Yeah. Um, he, he talks a lot about the fact that he just thinks that measurement is so immature still. Um, like what, what would you love, what, what would you like to see happen from a measurement perspective in this space so that, that we get uh, the ability to prove the kind of value of what should be more valuable data than just traditional kind of media owner intent data or kind of behavioral data? Yeah, it's a great question. I think my, my thoughts on it are, at the moment, we still, we started to touch a little bit on the panel earlier. I think we still look at it very, very much at the lower funnel, the conversion-based um, opportunities and what yeah. that delivers you know, how can we deliver the maximum return for the investment, which is the right thing to do. But as I think with anyone, any marketer is what you're looking at is over what period, over mm -hmm. what period of time, how do we finesse that? Like, so if, if I buy a product and I know that that product, uh, you know, I'm going to use it for three months, then the effect of the advertising that I'm going to have is not going to really be seen immediately. It will kind of come over a longer period of time. Yeah. So I think it's a move away from this kind of instantaneous effect to longer term and also cumulative. Yeah. So one of the things that's really valuable is, well, what's the effect if I run multiple campaigns? Right. How does that affect the me versus mm -hmm. the category? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just that finesse that we're bringing in, which is moving from that single moment to longer term right. omni-channel. Um, but I think Carl's point comes absolutely right. I think the industry will evolve even more because, because also the way in which you can combine measurement data using data clean rooms is advancing so yeah. fast. Yeah. And I think that piece together, combining different really interesting data sets, I mean, we're doing some work on this at the moment, where you combine probably data sets that you would like to have always understood the effectiveness of, um, mm -hmm. you know, 
you know, for example, like how do you understand the effectiveness of linear TV in maybe a different way right. than it is today on so with retailer data? These are the sort of things that I think that will open up as well. Yeah, again, we touched on it on the panel earlier. That the, the, the promise here is that actually retail media helps us to reset some of the, the challenges mm. we've had in media per se. Like, let's be honest, even with a third party cookie, the quality of targeting, measurement, precision, actually really knowing whether there is attention or not hasn't been ideal. Yeah. Um, and it feels like all of the tools and technologies are now coming to coming to market that are allow us to solve for that. So I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think that's a, that's a really good point. So thank you for making the time. It's always, always a, a pleasure a, to uh, talk to you. It's lovely to see you, really uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll see each other again, although the com the conference circuit, as you said earlier, might about to be coming to a bit yeah, of a standstill. Okay. So we'll have to go into business planning mode for a while. <laughs> I look forward to it. And that is a wrap for this episode of Time for a Reset, the marketing podcast with global leaders, brought to you by CB Consultancy. I've been your host, Paul Frampton, and I hope the insights from this episode will help you reset and refine how you implement successful change for strategic transformation for your brand. Look forward to seeing you next week as I chat with another senior marketing leader. And please don't forget to follow us on your favorite listening platform, Apple, Spotify, or whatever else. Look forward to catching you soon.